Hello there, my friends. I've got a great conversation, an excellent guest joining me today, one of my all-time favorite journalists who was at NPR for several years, and she has covered and been prescient about changes in technology, institutions, society in general, covering tech, climate change, social movements, mental health, education, and parenting for almost two decades. Journalist and author Anya Kamenetz joins me here on the podcast. Been way too long since we talked. She's launched a really great new newsletter, The Golden Hour, and you will love it. That conversation begins at about 20 minutes in. But first, some news and notes. This is show number 1000 of this podcast adventure, this experiment in broadcasting and media and learning This dream come true for me and many of you who didn't give up on me when I lost my gig at SiriusXM, where so many of you that join me now first heard me and the old radio show. So I'm very excited to be here with you. I can't have done it without your support. All of you have been paid subscribers from the beginning. You are and always will be so important to me, and I hope to ride this baby out with as many of you as I can, and hopefully more. Always trying to add new subscribers. Can't do it without your subscriptions. It is an ad-free show, and that you don't see very often. That's the way I'm trying so hard to do it and keep it this way, but I certainly can't do it without you. Not going to make too much more of a big deal about it other than to celebrate show number 1,000. We're all going to get together, and it's actually more than 1,000 shows. I've lost track and didn't number all of them at one point, so... Technically, it's not the thousandth show, but we'll celebrate more than a thousand shows in Vegas on March 22nd and 23rd. And so I hope to see you there. Details coming soon. And don't forget to go check out my new stand-up special. Go to drybarcomedy.com slash Pete D. Link in the show notes. Let's do the news, shall we? Yeah, the old news bed. Bringing it back. For you old timers, long time listeners, let's see, what should we start with? I think probably the biggest story of yesterday. Well, hard to say, but I'll lead with one that no one saw coming. An unexpected declaration from the Vatican. Pope Francis has formally approved allowing priests to bless same sex couples with a new document explaining a radical change in Vatican policy by insisting that people seeking God's love and mercy shouldn't be subject to an exhaustive moral analysis just to receive it. So not quite sure what that means, how big of a deal of, that it is. Apparently, it's a, it's a real development, though. So uh, I guess that's good news. I posted just the headline on my local Facebook page where there's a whole lot of conservative right wingers and the reaction was mixed. But most people were supportive of it. So I was glad to see that. Uh, one lady said that we need to change gay people back. And I wondered why she couldn't just leave them alone and let them be happy. But I haven't heard back from her. Uh, Another big story out of Texas yesterday where the governor, who is a cartoon villain, Greg Abbott, he signed into law a new measure empowering the state's police to arrest migrants who enter the state from Mexico without authorization. The legislation, which takes effect in March, is expected to set up a court fight between Texas and the federal government over immigration enforcement powers. So we'll certainly be closely following that. Opponents of the law vowed to file suit to stop it from taking effect. They argue that Texas lacks the authority to enforce immigration laws under the Constitution. Some sheriffs, of course, the yeehaw types along the border, have also opposed legislation expressing concern that local jails and courts could be overwhelmed if even a fraction of those who cross the border every day were arrested. So we need a federal solution to this, not a state solution. That's always, I think, been the case. Speaking of immigration in Washington, hopes dimmed for a quick quick deal on immigration policy, which Republicans have been demanding before approving an aid package for Ukraine. I mean, they left the House Republicans left. It's only the Senate that was trying to bang this out and doesn't look good. In Israel, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin stopped by, told top Israeli leaders that protecting civilians was a strategic imperative. For the Israeli campaign in Gaza, Pentagon officials said that Israel's use of unguided munitions could explain the high death toll. Do you think? I'm pretty sure I didn't need to be the Secretary of Defense or a military expert 
to figure that one out. The Transportation Department of the United States has announced it will fine Southwest Airlines $140 million over a meltdown that disrupted travel for about 2 million people during last year's holiday season. The penalty, most of it in the form of frequent flyer points and vouchers to customers, is roughly 30 times the department's previous largest penalty against an airline for consumer protection violations. So looks like those people are going to be made whole, at least on their flights. Thank you, Pete Buttigieg, is all I have to say about that. A federal appeals court yesterday rejected an effort by former White House chief of staff and guy who's in a tremendous amount of trouble and probably won't find work easily, Mark Meadows, to move his Georgia election interference case out of state court. The 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a judge's ruling from September that said Meadows had not demonstrated that the alleged conduct that prompted his prosecution was related to his official duties in the Trump administration. So a real setback for all Mark Meadows. And that, I think, is pretty good news because he should be set way back and probably be in jail. The Department of Justice made news yesterday unveiling a new national database to track serious misconduct violations by federal law enforcement officers. A move authorities said would help ensure that those officers are not unwittingly hired by other government agencies. That is also good news. Thank you to the Department of Justice for that. A judge issued an injunction halting the removal of a Confederate memorial at Arlington National Cemetery. A Delaware man was charged with driving under the influence of alcohol after crashing into the president's motorcade. No, it wasn't his son, Hunter, you jerks. And global oil prices jumped yesterday after energy giant BP said it had stopped sending tankers through the Red Sea because the route has become increasingly dangerous since the Houthi group began attacking ships with drones and missiles. Thursday is the shortest day of the year, folks. Winter begins officially the winter solstice this Thursday. I hope to see you at our hangout where we will celebrate. We'll have a winter solstice celebration. Looking forward to seeing you there. All right. Those are your headlines. Now, a few audio clips for you, and we'll get to my great interview with the brilliant Anya Kamenetz. Let's see. What do I have for you in the audio grab bag? First, we'll start with the most triggering clips. Brian Kilmeade's voice always does it for me, especially yesterday when on Fox and Friends morning show, he went to bat for former President Donald Trump after the huge backlash on the Sunday shows exploded from his Poison America comments during the weekend speech. Of course, Trump telling supporters at a New Hampshire rally on Saturday that immigrants from Africa and Asia are poisoning the blood of our country. Now, here's Kilmeade trying to act like, oh, yeah, what's the big deal? There's other things going on, too, is that uh, President over the weekend gave some, uh, had a speech, huge rally, unbelievably, uh, unbelievable crowd in New Hampshire, and they didn't like his rhetoric. He was talking about the border. He was talking about people coming from other countries, coming from prisons, and they wanted to focus all the Sunday shows, Lawrence, on the word he used, poison. He was just trying to say, we want to keep America, America. We want to build up the border and find out who's coming in and out. And they tried to say, though, this language was the problem. Yeah, they tried to say this language was the problem, of course, the language being compared to the former autocrat from Germany, the Nazi one, the Hitlery one. Now, here's another one. Mark Short. This is the Mike Pence's former chief of staff still defending Donald Trump. I mean, he's been critical of him as well at times. But in cases like this, really, he also was on Fox News, the Sunday panel for discussion on Trump's glaringly anti-immigrant remarks during his New Hampshire campaign rally. And as Shannon Bream, the anchor, pointed out, Trump drew widespread criticism, renewed comparison to Hitler's Mein Kampf after raving that immigrants from South America, Africa and Asia are poisoning the blood of the country. Well, here's Mark Short's defense. Mark, on forced error or on purpose? Look, I I think it's highly unlikely that Donald Trump's ever read Mein Kampf. I think the reality is what we have is that. The left continues to attack him for something outrageous, he says, but it continues to drive the issue back to border security, which is what he wants to be talking about. He has a decisive lead on border security over Joe Biden, just like he does on the economy, just like he does on international affairs. And so, yeah, he says something outlandish. They attack what he said rhetorically. But if you come back to the root of the issue, it's where a lot of the American people agree with him on. All right. Well, I mentioned last night, and there's been reporting of this before, that Trump, I said last night that Trump had a copy of Mein Kampf on his nightstand. In fact, apparently it wasn't a copy of Mein Kampf, but perhaps a collection of Hitler's speeches 
Ivana Trump, Donald Trump's first wife, told her lawyer, Michael Kennedy, that from from time to time, her husband reads a book of Hitler's collected speeches titled My New Order, which he keeps in a cabinet by his bed. It's not a secret that Donald Trump does not mind being compared to Hitler. He might have also thought he did have a copy of Mein Kampf because... There's a quote of Donald Trump saying, my friend Marty Davis from Paramount, who gave me a copy of Mein Kampf, and he's a Jew. Marty Davis said, I did give him a book about Hitler, but it was my new order, Hitler's speeches, not Mein Kampf. I thought he would find it interesting. I'm his friend, but I'm not Jewish. (laughs) I mean, it's slightly confusing, but apparently... He did keep a book of Hitler's speeches. He's admitted to it, and he's familiar with it. Nobody tell Mark Shorter of the right-wing echo chamber that doesn't know about this reporting and these quotes from Donald Trump. So they can keep denying that he is directly quoting the type of rhetoric that Hitler used, as well as touting the credibility and performances of strongmen around the world like Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un, and Viktor Orban. So... We're seeing it pretty much every day now. We've been warned. We can't say we haven't been warned. We've been covering it very effectively in both the corporate media, the independent media, the alternative media, whatever media you want. You can see and find and listen to scholars and historians talking about this man's authoritarian style. And we've seen it all before. All right, well, let me shift gears and let's listen to the defense secretary. This is Lloyd Austin. He was in Israel and promoted a two-state solution. Now, in my meetings today, I also discussed the need to take urgent action to stabilize the West Bank. Attacks by extremist settlers against the Palestinians in the West Bank must stop. And those committing the violence must be held accountable. Now, We know that the past 72 days have been some of the most painful days in Israel's history. But it would compound this tragedy if all that was waiting for the Israeli people and your Palestinian neighbors at the end of this awful war was more insecurity, fury, and despair. As I've said, Israelis and Palestinians have both paid too bitter a price to just go back to October 6th. So I discuss past ways today toward a future for Gaza after Hamas, based upon the clear principles laid down last month by my friend, Secretary Blinken. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. So the United States continues to believe, as we have under administrations of both parties, that it is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states, living side by side in mutual security. Now, we know how hard that is, especially after October 7th. But ongoing instability and insecurity only play into the hands of Hamas. So we must think together about what lies beyond this terrible season of terror and war. And as we do, the United States will remain deeply committed to the security and self-defense of the state of Israel. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Not going to happen, I don't think. But do appreciate the sentiment, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin in Israel yesterday. And I was off last week, and there's one more clip that I wanted to play for you that I saw last week that I thought was, well, perfect. And, of course, it came from Stephen Colbert asking the tough question to Liz Cheney. The question she wasn't asked by Rachel Maddow or Jay Tapper or whoever else interviewed her on other networks. No, it was left to the late night comedian to ask her the best question, the most important question. I thought that she'd been asked in all of her interviews. and I did see a lot of them. And it's the question about whether or not, and he perfectly distilled it, The Republican Party ceded the ground for Trump, that it was the Republican Party that was always the party open to and welcoming, whistling to anti-Semites and racists and xenophobes and anti-gay people. It's always been that way. The people, they hated the media. They ridiculed media and academia, scientists, and of course, most importantly, government. I feel like Colbert 
absolutely nails this question, and Liz Cheney never even attempts to answer it, simply denying that there could be any connection. I, I do want to ask one thing, though, and I don't, I don't mean this as a partisan question, but I mean it as a, a real curiosity. Um, there are left-wing dictators, yeah. and there are right-wing dictators. Yeah. There, are, there are communist and socialist dictators who go to any means and any amount of people have to die or be trampled in order to achieve whatever freedom for the proletariat. And then there are fascist dictators, right-wing dictators, who in the name of preserving some imagined status quo or some imagined past that needs to be returned to will go to any lengths and any, anyone needs to be trampled or, or killed in order to achieve that. So I'm not saying that it is it is the purview of one party. Why do you think, though, for the first time in our nation's history, the Republican Party won that race and got the first fascist dictator who could possibly take office? I'm just curious if you've done any self-examination of your party's leadership over the last 20 years as to why he is not an aberration, but rather an avatar. I, I think he's an aberration. Um, I think really? that, yeah, I mean, I, look, I think what Donald Trump has done is, first of all, he, he tapped into a sense among a lot of people in this country that their voice isn't heard. Um, but he then lied to them and he preyed on their patriotism and he told them, you know what, I'll speak for you. Um, but very and- specifically through things like. Racism, like Mexicans yeah. are rapists, they're killers, they're here to get us. Like no, that's look, that's mean, a very I, racist ideology. Absolutely, and and undermining of, things, of the media. What, that's a very that's a very fascist thing look, to do. There's no question that he's using a fascist playbook, right? Um, but it's also true right now. If you want to talk about, you know, uh, for example, the the disgusting anti-Semitism. That is on the rise across this country. The left has a huge problem with anti-Semitism. At that point, I would have lost my mind. What a shocking, shocking answer for her to give that Stephen Colbert talks about the Republican Party ideology leading to a Donald Trump. She says, no, that's not true. I don't believe it. And what about the left and the rise of anti-Semitism on the left? And what we're seeing on our university campuses, for example, and, and the unwillingness to stand against it. So I would agree yes. that anti-Semitism is a disease that runs across all cultural boundaries, not only in the United States, but across the world. Right. But what, what, I, what, I, what I mean by, say, undermining the media is no, I'm, I'm, un, un, right. under, undercutting sort of like roughing up the referee was a project of the right for the last 20 years or undermining yeah, public institutions. You, no. you say that people believe that our public institutions can take the punishment that Trump will give them. And that's why he's not as dangerous as he should be. But. I mean, the Republican Party's mantra has been the government is the problem for so many years. Yeah, but see, this is it's really important, um, in my view, that we not sort of slide into saying everything the Republicans have ever done, you know, uh, is somehow the same as what Donald Trump is doing. I'm not saying everything. I'm and, saying and it, it is, not, those are breadcrumbs. Yeah, but I, I think you and I are just not going to agree on that. I mean, I think it's I, I think, know we're not going to agree. But do you but understand I, why I'm asking that question? Yeah, but I think you should let me answer it. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I, look, I think that um, when I stood in front of my colleagues, for example, when they kicked me out of leadership, um, I, I said to them, you know, we cannot become the party of anti-Semitism and white supremacy and racism and bigotry. And if you look at the people uh, and the symbolism that the people had who invaded the Capitol on January 6th, they had neo-Nazi insignia. The Confederate flag flew for the first time inside the Capitol on that day. And and the Republican Party, maybe what we should say is we can debate about how we got to this point. I think the Republican Party has people who, who have been in the party have a particular duty to stand against where we are today. Um, and I also think we all have to recognize he's using a fascist playbook. I mean, I'm, I don't disagree with what you're saying. He's taking the same steps that we have seen people all around the world take in the past. And the, the, the challenge for us as Americans is not to say to ourselves, well, that can never happen here. The people who are claiming that he is, you know, going to uh, unravel the Constitution if he's elected again are catastrophizing. We can't, we can't go down that path. We have to understand this is a very real threat. And there'll be a lot of time for us to debate how we got to this place. Um, but Right now, we have to stand together as Americans to stop him. Of course, and then she gets an applause, and 
I just am so disenchanted and unsatisfied with her answers. I respect Stephen for drilling her on that and trying to hold her feet to the fire. And then, yeah, well, you heard it. You can come to your own conclusion. But I thought that was really, really good. So I wanted to play as much of it as I could for you here. And while I usually like to end the news on a comedy clip, that's going to be it right there for the sound and all of the news segment. How about it? Let's get to my guest, shall we? Very excited to have Anya Kamenetz back on the show. She has a, launched a new Substack, and she's one of my favorite writers and journalists, so I just absolutely had to have her come on and talk about it and promote it. It's called The Golden Hour. It's a newsletter about living in what's called the polycrisis with all of these terrible things things happening at once and that's actually a word and i learned it she talks about trying to find calm hope and joy in the moment as we deal help our children deal with the very tough stuff happening in the world and expected in the future people interested in climate justice mental health education and technology will like it even if they don't have kids but the golden hour is a community of people who care about the future and therefore about our children and Anya is one of the smartest people I know. She's a journalist and author who's had a really solid track of, frankly, being prescient about changes in technology, institutions, and society in general. She's covered tech, climate, social movements, mental health, education, parenting for almost two decades and spent eight years covering education for NPR. She's published five books, Generation Debt, about young people's economic struggles, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. Also launched the Life Kit Parenting, which was a successful podcast series about difficult conversations. And now she's working with the Aspen Institute's This Planet is Ed initiative and the Climate and Mental Health Network. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, her two children. And I was so happy to catch up with Anya. She really is one of the best. The goldenhour.substack.com. Go subscribe for free if you like it. Send her a paid subscription. Let's do it right now. Yes, Anya Kamenetz is back and I'm very happy to see you and congratulations on the golden hour. I'm always excited when you're doing anything, much less something new. Good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. It's great to see you again, Pete. Yeah, so you left NPR last year, 2022. This year's almost over. And Mm -hmm. you you decided to head in a different direction. You covered education. You wrote this amazing book, The Stolen Year, uh, about kids and COVID and how it affected us. And then you are on to this. Tell us about the Golden Hour and why you chose to kind of make the pivot. You know, it's so funny. And obviously, we have this in common, right? Like, you make these choices and then you see how you're part of bigger trends, right? So my my feeling that was welling up in me was just that I had this concern about the climate crisis. It was intersecting with my, you know, what I've been doing for a long time, which is generational justice. What are we doing for our kids? What are we doing with our kids uh, to make a better world? And it wasn't fitting in the box of traditional journalism. I mean, it really wasn't just about the the conventions of journalism weren't, weren't going to do it for me. I needed to be able to write in a different way and speak in a different way. And so, and we're seeing that everywhere, right? People are like traditional journalism is, is kind of in a mess. Social media is in a mess and people are trying to find their own platforms and their own ways of communicating to the people that care the most. So the Substack is uh, weekly and it's about just that, you know, just how to parent kids in the reality that we're in today, not just we forget about the future for a second, you know, what is the reality right now and how are we actually living into it and and being the best parents that we can be given everything that's going on in the world. I love this and I'm sure I'm not alone. I think it's super important. I'm glad it's you doing it. And I'm sure like me, a lot of other people have followed your career and your books. And I wonder how uh, it's being received. I wonder how this project is being received by by readers, because it really is a unique, I think, venture and the way you're covering it and, and using all of, I think, you who you are in your life. You write some pretty personal stuff. I learned a lot about you and I thought I knew a good bit about you. And I, I really think that's very important, especially always using yourself and your parent experience. What's been the uh, reaction so far for your. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, and it it's, it's been really lovely, you know, and I'll, this is the, the craziest thing that happened. When I posted about this on Instagram, I, or I ordered Adam, my husband, a, a shiitake log for Hanukkah. So, you know, you, you water it and then it like sprouts mushrooms. You get mushrooms in your house. 
regular eating mushrooms, right? Yeah. And Field of Forest is the organization, the company that sells them. It arrived with a note from someone who works there who was like, I love your work. I love what you're doing about climate and kids and education. And like, I just want you to know, like, it's really making an impression. <laughs> P.S. If this is not the same Anya Kamen as he used to work for NPR, carry on. Have a nice day. <laughs> that is the best. Oh, that is so great. I absolutely. It's literally the best ever. It's the best ever. And I'm so grateful. And, you know, because when you share part of yourself and really it's the struggle, right? Like, like the things that are happening in the world right now cause a lot of pain and a lot of heartbreak and loneliness. And I think that just opening up that conversation and saying, here, we can talk about this. Yeah, it, it makes a connection with people. One thing I've learned a, a lot in the past few years is it really helps me when someone can just name m my feeling and what I'm dealing with, with a few words or one word. And yeah. you've helped do that in a lot of different ways throughout your work. But with the golden hour, you introduced me to this term, poly crisis. Uh -huh. And I just think it's so helpful to then introduce it to anybody listening now that hasn't heard it. It's this yeah. idea about uh, all these things happening at once. It describes the interplay between COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the energy cost of living, climate crisis. That was a one definition of it written before what's happening in the Middle East now and anything yeah. else that people are focused on locally and within themselves. You can take it yeah. from there about why this word matters and you're including it really kind of in the about section of the golden hour, your new Substack. Yeah. I mean, so I found it really helpful and I'm glad that you did too. And I think it helps us understand that these crises are intersecting and they're interacting and they're building on each other because they are taking our energy. They're sapping our attention. They're taking our emotional energy. Um, they're disrupting our lives. I mean, this, the sense of disruption, I think has become so familiar to people where they're just like, okay, what's my plan A? What's my plan B? And how do I actually get my way out of this? And I don't know if it could be Pete, that the certainty that we grew yeah. up to rely on yeah. was maybe just a particular blip in time in terms of like post-war America, like 50s through the 90s, maybe. And then this is more like how people have lived forever. But mm -hmm. the other layer of it is we have social media, 24-hour news cycle, and these algorithms that prey on our limbic system, right? Like our emotional responses and just our guaranteed and designed to make us upset about something, no matter what is actually happening in the world. I so think, that just yeah, I think what I'm hearing is, you know, before we were civilized humans, uh, <laughs> we, there was this uncertainty. You never knew it was going to happen with the weather, with sustenance, with water, with, with anything. You don't know what the weather yeah. would be like tomorrow. Yeah. Now, for years, we had a certain sense of certainty. We've now lost that, which creates a lot of chaos in our minds, anxiety and worry. And even more importantly, just when you feel like you have some certainty, a blip on your device creates new uncertainty or new anxiety. And that's the thing that is different about this generation of humanity. That's kind of what I'm hearing in a yeah. experiential version, a I guess. Great breakdown. Yeah. It's a great breakdown. The flip side of it or the good news of it is that we have a lot of ancient wisdom to rely on in terms of how people have lived with oh, uncertainty yes. and in embedded, just like as you, as you suggested, right? And we have modern wisdom and understanding about the brain, about mindfulness, about mental health. And putting those things together, we can forge ahead, I think, with equilibrium, with happiness, with a sense of purpose and uh, live through this and thrive through this. Honestly, I don't think we have any other choice. So some people might think, well, if this is a subject matter, it's going to be always depressing. <laughs> but I think what's best about you and your work is you find the joy, the levity, the peace in all of this chaos. And you're doing that with your work as well and trying to help us sort out our feelings at the same time, giving us permission to feel yeah. them. I felt a lot of permission in reading The Golden Hour. I'm like, ah. Oh, Thank goodness that's not just me. So tell me more about your insistence on finding the joy in all of the chaos, in the polycrisis, which is something I suppose is ancient and new. 
Yeah, you know, I'll talk about it specifically in terms of one of the most fun things that we created, not only has it been in the Substack, but with Climate and Mental Health Network, and that's the Climate Emotions Wheel. So this is a visualization of climate emotions, and it's based on the work of Panu Pakala, who is a researcher in Finland. And this is your know, color rainbow full spectrum wheel, and it has quadrants. So you've got grief, fear, and sadness. And then the fourth quadrant is this positivity, right? So, you know, and just the fact, the recognition of the fact that even in the face of what we see happening all around us, we do have the option and many people do feel empathy, interest, hope, you know, a sense of determination. So there are always, and I'm not a Pollyanna by any means, but I think that a full recognition of our humanity begs us to notice that there is always room for joy. It's always there if you're, if you're looking for it. That made me think that while you're saying this and describing the climate emotions, we all like, that's an awesome device and idea and helps explain stuff. And I bet you the people that don't think about climate change or don't believe in it would eye roll the climate emotions real, which makes me wonder about how much you think about those who don't have this ever on their mind versus those of us who do. Sometimes I feel like I'm privileged to be worried about this because things are going better in my life. I wasn't thinking about anything in the world when I lost my corporate media job. I was thinking about work, work, mm-hmm. work, work, work. How do I get work? How do I get work? I wasn't thinking about poverty, yeah. racism and all the other things that I've covered. And then there are obviously the people who are just in denial about it. And mm-hmm. so a lot of us worry about a lot of the same things. But only some of us worry and think about climate the way that you and I certainly do. What about that? Uh, I think it's a really good point. I think that the it is a privilege to be able to take the step back and look at things at a systemic level. I've been doing focus groups with families about talking to kids about climate change. And, you know, there are different flavors of I wouldn't say denialism, but I would say Mm de-emphasis, right? To say, well, this is something for the media to worry about or politicians. And I don't really have a personal interest in this, but everyone's experiencing extreme weather everywhere around the country. People are experiencing firsthand effects and they can see even people who are 12 and 13 and 14 years old can remember a change in weather patterns. It's happening that fast. And so you don't have to have a conversation about climate change. You can have a conversation about wow, it hasn't snowed for two years in New York City. You know, what about that wildfire smoke? And that itself creates feelings that we can have a conversation about. You don't have to convince anyone. That's that's the weird gift of this moment. Right, right, right. Very well said. And, you know, one of the, I guess, biggest issues, primary issues that young people think about, well, that anybody thinks about today is, is it okay to bring kids into this world? Well, guess what, folks? Anya's got you covered at thegoldenhour.substack.com with a great post about that written in a way that only you could. It starts very personal, which I really loved because you talk about your dad. Uh, But, you know, you can then get into the data, includes a whole bunch of links. But this seems like probably one of the biggest questions that my daughters are already thinking a little bit about. And, uh, you know, what do you what do you hear from people in terms of this question? And what are the. The answers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously concern is growing and, you know, it's not just about climate change. Our Gen Z and our sure. Gen Alpha's thoughts about reproducing and bringing kids into this world are colored by all kinds of things, by reproductive rights, dangers and uh, health care and the job market. And, you know, I could go on and on. Well, um, yeah, gun, gun violence for a certain age, the leading cause of death that you're, you're always going to worry about the leading cause of death. And in this case, it's a horrific one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciated um, that. Yeah, that Gen Z are on a couple of. Oh, yeah, it's, he's great. I'm trying amazing. to. I'm, yeah, please send any. Uh, I'm sure, you know, a lot of great young people. I'm always looking for people to interview. It's hard to find them on my own from the shed. So I rely on smart folks. But thank you. Go absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I love that. And um you, you know, you love to see that kind of engagement. You hate that he has to do that, right? You, exactly. you hate that these kids have to go out there. Yeah. The question of whether or not to have kids for your particular feelings about what's going on in the world, aside from this is everybody's personal decision, and I am not here to tell anyone what to do ever. But in terms of what's going on in the world, I think what the problem is that 
you know, your kids don't just belong to you. Everybody has a share in the future and future generations and what happens to them. And so whether you have kids or not is almost irrelevant to what's going to happen with climate change. And it's also irrelevant to whether or not you have to care about what's going to happen because you're going to be concerned with the future no matter what happens. And so ultimately where I land is to say that, you know, the uncertainty is very hard to deal with and it's a very, very personal decision, but it is too personal and too important to you as an individual to make that decision on the basis of what is better or what you think might be better for the planet as a whole. You've got to think about your own happiness and you've got to think about the potential of investing in the future. What makes you, what kind of life you're going to lead with kids or without kids and what life kind of life are those kids going to lead? You can't know. And people have been having kids for millennia without having any idea what's going to happen to them. And that's a little bit of the humility that we have to bring. I think as, as you as a parent know very well, we can't control it. We can control only what we can and adapt to it. And a lot of parents I think are are doing what you told me your husband was doing this morning after this terrible windstorm, which is yeah. they're doing storm recovery with their kids. My friend Mark Nolte out in Iowa and so many other people bring their kids out, you know, they, their teenage kids, whatever, with chainsaws uh, mm-hmm. after a, a storm. Or in this case, you told me that your husband brought your, your uh, son out, right? Um, my set, my seven year old daughter. So she was, uh, she loved to like get on her rain gear and go on our block and clear the drain, um, make sure that everything was okay for our neighbors. And I think, you know, these are the kinds of things that speak so much louder than anything we say, right? Yes. Yes. Role model. It's why I bought an electric car in 2010 because my kids were little and I, and I thought, well, if they see me plug it in every day and they see the solar panels on the roof every day, I'm not making uh, in any kind of difference to the world so much as I am to them, which I find to be my responsibility. Ironically, I've taught them to litter. We litter all the time on that. <laughs> this constant littering. No, I mean, that's another thing we do clean up, you know, those types yeah. of things are role modeling behavior and you're teaching your kids to adapt to this or any crisis and maybe teaching them to do the same for theirs is sorry for talking so much, but I just thought it was great that you, you and your husband and your daughter went out and did that. Totally. And you know, it's, it's so interesting too, because you think about how we're seeing these changes through their eyes. And obviously for us, it's terrifying and it's not normal to have this giant rainstorm and have it be 60 degrees in December. I mean, that is not okay. And yet for them, it's their world. And so, you know, they have to live in it and accept it and have, and they deserve to have joyful engaged lives. And I think this is going to be the story of the rest of our lives working to make things better in this world, the way it is. You have been advocating for and channeling kids interests your entire career. And you're continuing to do that here at the golden hour. You've talked to kids, you've focus group kids with the other groups that you work with and for Uh, what are the kids saying? I mean, I've kind of been talking about it and around it, but what are yeah. the kids saying when you talk to them and, and what kinds of different things do you hear uh, and what do they want us to do in terms of being advocates? Cause we have more power than them. So there's obviously stages with this. There's a surprising amount of anxiety in the young kids when they first start to hear about this. And I interviewed an eight year old who was up at night, you know, she goes to school in Los Angeles and she's watching out the window of the bus, looking at plastic in the highway and thinking about how it's going to choke the bird. So she's really like got this system in her mind. Um, So that's really upsetting. I think the older kids, it starts to harden a little bit into, you know, skepticism and resentment and anger that the adults are not doing anything. And then the resignation, which is horrible to hear where they're just like, yeah, I guess we're just screwed. The flip side of it is just indomitable, life force, opportunity, interest, and curiosity from kids who decide to get engaged and stay engaged. And they're looking for opportunities, Pete. I mean, there's a huge hunger for kids to see how they can build their careers in sustainability and become part of the solution in a really concrete way. I think that's probably one of the most dominant voices that I hear. That's great to hear. All of that is important. And, you know, it's the idea that there's so much opportunity right now for so many 
solutions. It's it, there's the kind of a gold rush of it. You don't know what's going to work. You don't know often what's responsible, what's kind of a greenwashing or a lie or a scam. Yeah. So it's hard to know what direction uh, to go in. But from the federal government, the state government and local government to academia and obviously the private sector where people are making billions trying to adapt to this crisis. It is a yeah. huge new economy for yeah. these people. And I guess I don't know what my question is about it, but I would I would imagine there's hope there if you're solving the problem and making a living while you're doing it, as opposed to uh, a lot of people still working in, say, the fossil fuel industry that are making a good living but part yeah. of the problem. I hear from some of them. I'm sure you have. And they feel guilty about it. But that's their job right now. This guy doesn't have another job that he can go yeah. to in Wyoming. He might be one of the best guys I know. So yeah. it, it makes you feel differently to a certain extent about yourself. I mean, the younger generation wants to go a different way. And I'm like more power to them. They don't want to be standing in the road holding up signs and yelling and getting arrested. They want to have jobs right. and have opportunities and build their life as part of the solution. And I think, I mean, there's definitely contingent that wants to do that and be activists. And I'm totally pro activism, but there's more to it than that. They want to sit at the table. They want to be making decisions and they want to be thinking about this. And, you know, this is also about their futures in all, both personally and, and politically in the world. So I really do think that that's a huge opportunity for educators as well as parents to really help kids get engaged in a way that intersects with their interests and their passions. Talk to me about the activist class of young people. I, yeah. as you may or may not know, am a judgmental prick. So <laughs> when I see things that people are doing that I think aren't effective or won't mm -hmm. further the ball, I'm like, yeah. stop doing that. That's annoying. Yeah. Uh, and that's because I'm a judgmental and because I never went to a protest when I was their age either. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I could I yeah. didn't have a chance to get it wrong or right. But talk to me about the active activist class of young people and, yeah. you know, their inner, I guess, uh, arguments with each other about what works and what doesn't. And maybe your thoughts, if you have them on what works and what doesn't, what's effective. I, I do. I do. I mean, I'm a supporter of Climate Emergency Fund, which supports some of the most disruptive activism around the world. And it's not the only climate group that I support, but I believe in what is classically called the multiplicity of tactics. And sometimes it's called the Malcolm versus um, Martin, right? So you have mm. Martin Luther King Jr., who is a very respectable, who wears a suit, who is a pastor, who is asking for inclusion, who's working in the federal government, work, working for federal legislation, for equality, for civil rights, for an ideal that everyone can get behind. And then you have Malcolm X, saying by any means necessary, we are extremists, we are separatists, this is black power, we're not asking for permission. And what happens is in this spectrum, Malcolm makes Martin look more centrist and more, more acceptable. He pushes people, right? And it also expands the, uh, the amount of people that are paying attention to the issues uh, at the same time that it makes, you know, maybe, maybe Malcolm X is not going to get everything that he's asking for, but Martin is going to get the Civil Rights Act. And so this is a dynamic in social movements. And the people that are most annoying, the people that are throwing soup, the people that are sitting in the road, they make noise. And it's been shown and studied that that noise goes toward a better outcome for everyone. Because it's annoying. It's definitely going to be annoying. It's always going to annoy you. That's Kind of wise. I have somewhere to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm absolutely. on my way somewhere and you are in the way with your yeah. whatever your cause yeah. is. And I support your cause. Right. But you're making me not support your cause because I'm on my way to the game. And then yeah. at the game, now someone has glued themselves to center court. Now yeah. the game is delayed. And now, yeah. you know what? Fuck it. I'm buying a pickup truck. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that that is actually the logical emotions that people are going through. I, I, I think that's a very easy anecdote for someone to say about what happens as a result of some of these types of protests. But I don't know. I don't really know what the outcomes are. You know, I think it's complex. And I think there's another entire whole argument about it, which which I have also heard from these activists, which is this is an emergency. What are you supposed to do in an emergency? Are you supposed to sit there and continue your life or are you supposed to make a lot of noise? 
Um, so how do we actually collectively come to the understanding that this is an emergency? You know, and I, I posted this video um, in the Substack of the Climate Defiance, there, which is a U.S. group. Um, and they, you know, some scientists were giving the CEO of Exxon an award and they showed up with a very insulting sign and they disrupted it and shut it down. And it's like, yeah, why is the CEO of Exxon getting awards? That is definitely something to question in this day and age. That's awesome. I didn't see that. And now <laughs> yeah. I want to stop the interview and go watch it. But everybody <laughs> should. And you can find it at the golden hour. That's yeah. Yeah. I think I also have to ask you about, obviously, our responsibility. You have a, a great piece back in August. What we make children stand for. We're talking a lot about the kids. A lot of your yeah. work is about the kids, uh, yeah. direct communication with them. But I'm angry at our parents generation for a lot, a lot of things. So many things. I have these discussions with my parents. They're mostly on board with it. But my parents, my kids are and should be angry with my generation for yeah. quite a few things, I think, too. So I'm talking about, uh, you know, all of us say over 30, over 40. Those of us with kids, uh, we think about our parents and us. Uh, we have a lot to be responsible for. What we make children stand for is embarrassing, humiliating, and it, it makes me feel very angry and sad at the same time. What we haven't learned from our parents, what they might not have learned. Yeah, I mean, I think you definitely can see this with gun violence and you can see it with environmentalism. So there was a 12 year old from India who disrupted the COP28 climate conference just recently. There are these lawsuits that are happening all over the country with children basically suing for their right to a livable planet in various state courts. And that's fantastic. And they do it because it gets attention, right? And yeah. kids capture our attention. They capture the moral high ground. At the same time, I believe for me, it's like, well, where do I see my responsibility? I'm a parent. I should be the one that's out there. I don't want to make this my kid's responsibility. I want to make it my responsibility. And that's where you see groups like Moms Demand Action on the gun violence side. In in the climate area, there's uh, Moms Clean Air Force. It's one of a big group that we we work with. And just thinking about, you know, this is our job and the older generation has the money, the power. And when you talk about the grandparents, they also have the time. So I love to see like Bill McKibben's work with third act where he's organizing people over 60 to say, Hey, you're retired. You did great. Why don't you put in some time for the planet now and don't make the kids do it all. I didn't even know about that. I didn't know he was doing that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And mobilizing that grandparent energy, right? Because Ultimately, what I believe in, and there's a great study, and this is also in the Substack, um, that came out recently where they asked just an unprecedented number of like 10,000, tens of thousands of people around the world about the most effective climate messaging. And do you know what the, the most effective message was? Mm. Make the world better for the next generation. I mean, it should always work. But I just can't. I got an argument. Granted, it was on Facebook, you know, my community. And this guy's like, why should we care about them? I'm going to be dead. I'm like, oh, I wonder how many people think that. I wonder how many people think that. In America, we have a very selfish individualist strain. And so, so I often yeah. think that that's part of the, the the equation that a lot of people who don't care about the issue, even if they yeah. don't question the science, they know it's happening. They're like, I don't care. Yeah. And I and I wonder if that's an American thing or how 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 big of a deal that is sometimes. I think doomism and defeatism and indifference are part of the same ah. mind worm right. that's trying to stop us from acting, you know, and mm. who benefits from that? The corporations, the oil industry, the governments that don't want to act. And they just they put that in people's brains because you know what? It's a lot easier to wave your hands and say I don't care than to engage with what's going on because it's freaking scary. And I know that there are lots of people that just don't have the emotional bandwidth. They have their own trauma. And like you said, their own everyday struggles and they're not, they're not there for it. They cannot take in the account of what's actually happening. It's too scary. And so I think for me, it's just like, I'm trying to push that window a little bit. So a couple more people for the sake of what you love, what you really care about, maybe it's your kids. I hope it's your kids. I hope it's a place, a place that you will allow yourself to feel a little yeah. bit more and then hopefully act. You and I have been covering all the bad things that happen 
for our whole careers. And so if you want to stay in this business and in and, and this world and tell these stories and put your light on these issues and people, you have to have your own. I think you have to have your own personal practice to be able to get through it. I, I have mine. I try to share how what do you do? What do, what do you do when you're feeling defeated, depressed, scared, reading the news, covering the news, reading about these heart wrenching stories that young people are having to deal with uh, outside of uh, the existential issue about the climate? Uh, I love that question. Um, and I do. You need this such a toolbox. So yeah. for me, it's getting outside. You know, I go running almost every day. You do you know every, almost every day now. Almost I don't want to have a yeah. lot of thoughts about that <laughs> on the knees. Like I warn like I am yeah. a runner too. And I'm like, am I running too much? Not enough. I want to run as many years as I can, but, but that's great. I, that's great. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I obviously just digging in and spending time with my kids, you know, yep. and finding out things that are fun for them. It's a funny meme or it's a song that we can dance to. Um, just connecting that way. Uh, reliably what gives me joy. I mean, I have a, just a great group of friends who prioritize that in their lives, culture, art, dancing, you know, music. I think that, you know, spending that time intentionally with friends and a lot of times for working parents, that's the thing that goes by the wayside is your friendships. So what is, yeah. what is your, uh, how much mentoring, if any, do you do these days with, with young people? Cause as I, as I talk to you, every time I talk to you, I, I always have a thought at some point, even when I'm reading, to, you know, your stuff, I'm like, at some point I'm going to, you know, hope that my daughter will reach out to Anya and ask her a couple <laughs> questions about life or work or whatever. Yeah. But do you, do you talk to young people, um, about like life advice or, you know, outside of just journalism covering their stuff and do they get Anya's take? <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I like to do that. And I was just on a high school students podcast, actually. Um, okay. Someone I've gotten to know through this stuff who just, yeah, you know what? The kids are coming up behind us, Pete. Like she just decided to start a podcast and got on LinkedIn and like made Forget it happen. About it. Forget um, about it. Heidi Pan. But yeah, it's a huge privilege to be in contact with the regular Gen Z activists um, at Climate Mental Health Network. We have a Gen Z advisory board. And then at Aspen, they have the future leaders. So there's a lot of opportunities yeah. for me to just put it out there. I've done a little, I started to do a little teaching. I might be teaching. Um, oh, good. Yeah. I taught a course at American. I'm going to go come back and do it next year. And on what? Well, that was drawing on my, like, it was public communication. So it was com combining like traditional media, like media relations and op-ed writing with social media and how do we oh, cool. communicate online effectively. Yeah. Super yeah. fun. Yeah, you've seen it all. We've seen it all. I mean, yes, we have. <laughs> we've seen the old media turn into the new media and yeah. just trying to keep up watching it and harnessing it. Well, you're doing a great job um, by being on Substack. I absolutely love it. I'm so glad you you decided to do that. I think it's a perfect fit for you. And I guess my final question is, tell me one thing that maybe you learned or got um, something from the Substack, a, a piece or something that you learned that I haven't obviously asked about yet. Hmm. What have I learned that you haven't asked me about? Um, from my subject or someone else's? From yours, uh, like that we can go tell people to go read, or just anything about about it that we haven't talked of. Your favorite piece, uh, a reaction to something that surprised you. I think that's always interesting when you write this. You put a lot into it, and people are surprised you with their reactions. And, and anyway, um, well, I think one thing that's great is I. Um, I, my daughter's Montessori school teacher is a follower of the Substack. Yeah. Right? Her former teacher. Good stuff. Um, and she's awesome. And she's been working with these psychologists and they are looking at a theory of moral development in motherhood. So in parenthood, really. So basically it's like adolescence. We know that there's like cognitive stuff that happens. There's moral, social stuff that happens, your place in the world. And their theory is in the transition into parenthood, it's a similar kind of time. So you have the opportunity, maybe not everyone does, but you have the opportunity to develop and grow morally as a person in the world as your perspective deepens. That is fascinating and right? really interesting. And I definitely want to go. I didn't see that. I like it a lot. And I always love talking parenting, but especially uh, with you. Anya, thank you so much for joining me congratulations on all that you're doing and uh, let's check in whenever you want i'm a, as you know a huge fan thank you so much pete it was great talking to you again 
Yeah, well, how about it? Anya Kamenetz. Go check it out, everybody. The Golden Hour. Go subscribe to her Substack right now. Go follow her on social media. All the links in the show notes to find out more about Anya. And thank you very much for listening to today's special broadcast. I don't know why I said it was special. It's no different. I don't know. It's a thousand. I guess that makes it special. Episode number 1000, huh? Couldn't have done it without you. If you haven't heard my conversation with Eric Siegel, I just posted that up as well. Don't miss it. And that's all I've got for you, my bumblebees. Thank you very much to Anya Kamenetz. Please go write a review on Spotify and iTunes. Follow me on YouTube and TikTok and Threads and all of the rest. And watch my new stand-up special. Go to drybarcomedy.com slash Pete D. Check it out starting right there. That's it. That's all. John Carroll going to be with us in Las Vegas, and he's here with us each and every day. You're never alone if you're a member of the stand-up community. Take it away, Johnny. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Where every lost child will finally be found There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground And that's stand up, stand up Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all They had to stand up, they had to stand up They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of stand up But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws And since they weren't even sin They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up All right, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye We got to let him know It's his time to go To make it clear when all we hear is a lie See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up